This is the third MP3 unit for the Genesis module of the field-based SPS. It was recorded by Wilhelms Hornstra on 18 February 2010. Its subject is the first chapter of Genesis. Now, before you listen to this MP3 or read its script, I would ask you to read the handout on the Babylonian creation myth, Enuma Elish. As you do, try to write down a few similarities and differences between this myth and Genesis 1. Before looking at chapter 1, I would like to raise the question why the material in Genesis 1 through 11, these first 11 chapters in the book, is even included. Why does Genesis not start with chapter 12? After all, we're going to be dealing with the question of Israel, and this story does not begin until the end of chapter 11. In the first 11 chapters, there is no people of Israel. One answer to this question is, of course, that the first 11 chapters deal with questions of origin, and as such, they are important and interesting, fitting, as an introduction. More important, I think, is that these chapters provide us with a diagnosis, with an analysis of the human condition and humanity's problem. And in this way, these chapters put the story of Israel into a larger framework. They answer the why of Israel's story and the question why we would bother to learn about it. Now, shortly before recording this lecture, I taught the book of Genesis in Kyrgyzstan. This is not a country many people are familiar with. Think about it. What do you know about Kyrgyzstan? Where do the Kyrgyz people come from? Who were their ancestors? When did they begin to exist as a nation? Do they have a national father figure or a national hero? You probably do not know the answer to these questions and you may not be very interested to learn. The book of Genesis, together with Exodus, gives us precisely this sort of information on the people of Israel. It is their foundational history. So why would we? care. Well, chapter 1 through 11 make clear that the story of Israel is not there for its own sake, but has significance far beyond Israel. Its history is important for everyone, everywhere. This God is not just the God of Israel, a national deity, like there were many at the time, this is not religiously justified nationalism. The God of Israel is the creator of everything. And what God is going to do with Israel has the whole world in mind. That this is the way to read the story of Israel, and indeed the story of Abraham, finds clear confirmation in chapter 12, the first three verses. There are some clear parallels in this promise to what God says about humanity in chapter 1 and 2. These parallels include God's blessing and the idea of multiplication or many descendants. Dominion in Genesis 1 becomes possession of the land in the case of Abraham. Canaan as a land flowing with milk and honey is an echo of the Garden of Eden. In other words, what we are to understand is what Adam lost, Abraham and his descendants are going to receive back. Now, after chapter 11, the Old Testament will largely limit itself to the story of Israel, but in reading it, we should always keep this broader setting in mind. Israel or Abraham is God's answer to Adam. <laughs>
through this man and his descendants, God is going to undo the sin of Adam. So let's turn to Genesis 1 now. And I would like to start with a few preliminary remarks and observations. First, notice that the chapter division is not correct. Chapter 1 really continues until chapter 2, verse 3. It does not make sense to include the seventh day with a rather difficult, different account that begins in 2, verse 4. Second, there is some debate about the first half of 2, verse 4, which reads, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. Some think that this is the conclusion to chapter 1, rather than part of the introduction or title of chapter 2. However, uh, the Hebrew word translated generations appears 10 or 11 times in the book, and in all the other occurrences, it seems to introduce what follows. This is the case, for instance, in 5 verse 1, where it says, This is the book of the generations of Adam. So I will assume it is part of chapter 2, not the conclusion of chapter 1. Third, the fact that chapter 2 begins with such a title and chapter 1 does not is one of the features that sets this first segment in the book apart from the narratives that follow. Chapter 1 only uses the general Hebrew term for God Elohim, chapter 2, combines this with the personal name, Yahweh, which in most English translations is rendered as Lord in small capital letters. So it reads, Lord God, Yahweh Elohim. Then, the narrative that begins in 2 verse 4 continues all the way down to the end of chapter 4. At that point, it is interrupted by a gene genealogy, but it really continues until the first half of chapter 11. Its style is simple, <clears throat> almost naive, with a number of striking anthropomorphisms. It talks about God in very human terms. Chapter 1 is written in a very different elevated or exalted style. In fact, it begins with one of the most majestic and awe-inspiring sentences in all of Scripture. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. This is a huge sentence. It includes everything. What was before the beginning? Nothing. God. He has no beginning. And he has no match. Different from the creation myths in circulation at that time, God is all alone in creating the world. Genesis 1 is one of the greatest texts ever written. For this reason, chapter 1 stands somewhat apart and appears to be a prologue to the book, more than its beginning. And fourth, it is easy to see that the chapter has a very clear and repetitive structure. With the exception of the seventh day, we keep reading the same phrases for each day. The only departure from this is that both the third and the sixth day stand out as a double creation on these two days. Now, before we look a little closer at these days, and what happens on each of them, let me point out that to us, with our scientific, time-oriented mindset, there are several problems or difficulties in this text. How can light be created on the first day, before the sun and the stars? Of course, God can do it, but what does it suggest and how does it work? And how can there be days before the sun? After all, 
According to verse 14, this is what the sun is for, to separate the day from the night. Uh, but if so, how then were the first three days counted? Are these literal 24-hour days? How was that evening and morning on these first three days? In 1 verse 1, the earth is already there, created together with the heavens, but the rest of the solar system and the universe are not created until the fourth day. Now, this did not startle anyone in the ancient world, which had no concept of a solar system or ga galaxy, but is certainly not how modern day astronomers think about the universe. Verse 6 speaks of the firmament or expanse. The Hebrew word that is used su suggests something that is solid, as if there were a dome or a roof over the earth that prevents the waters above from falling on the earth. Well, some argue that this really does not reflect such a primitive view, but comparison with related terms in other Semitic languages and with ancient cosmologies, ancient models of the Earth and the universe, does support the idea of a solid dome. We still have two problems left that I would like to point out, uh, but uh, at this point I will make a little detour talk a bit more about ancient cosmology and geography, ancient geography. Generally, people in the ancient Near East thought of the Earth as a flat disk, resting on pillars and surrounded on every side by the sea, the primordial ocean out of which everything was created. Even below and above the Earth was this sea. Often it was assumed that there were high mountains on the edge of this disk that held up the sky, and the sky was usually thought of as a solid dome. Some thought it was made of sapphire or lapis lazuli, blue precious stone. After all, <laughs> it looks blue, and it looks like it really is a bit like a roof over the world. The stars so people thought were fixed to this firmament, and the clouds and the sun traveled by it. There were openings, or windows, in this firmament to let through the rain. Now this cosmos could also be thought of as a house or a temple. This is the way even some of the Psalms speak about it. Psalm 24, verse 2 reads, he has founded it, that is the earth, upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Psalm 104, verse 3 to 5, states that God lays the beams of his chambers on the waters. He set the earth on its foundations so that it should never be moved. Now, this is not to say that the Bible teaches such an understanding of the world. But it does not reject it or argue against it either. Genesis here and elsewhere keeps those elements of ancient cosmology that are theologically neutral. This is a clear example of what is often called accommodation. In Revelation, in speaking with humans, God accommodates or adjusts his revelation to what people know and can understand, to their everyday language and perception. The sun does not rise, for instance, since it really is the earth that moves, not the sun. But it certainly appears to the human eye as if it is the sun that is moving. We speak of the ends of the earth and of its four corners, 
the globe does not have ends or corners. In Genesis 1 verse 16, the moon is called a light, but in reality it merely reflects the light of the sun and does not actually give light. All of this as examples of, are examples of accommodation. People back then conceived of the cosmos in a certain way, in a way very different from us, but the Bible does not try to correct their science, only their theology. Okay, so far this little detour, back to those things that to us look strange or problematic in Genesis 1. Now, I'm not listing these difficulties to criticize the text or to make fun of other people's beliefs. I'm doing this to show that the text is part of a different setting and worldview. It does not follow our rules or fulfill our expectations. And I'm doing this to make room for a fresh, new reading of the context in its original setting and context. In chapter 2 it appears that the creation of man may have taken quite a while. Adam was created first, became lonely, named all the animals, and then God made Eve as he was sleeping. Now, this took time, but presumably it all happened on the sixth day. Besides, other little problem, in Genesis 2 the animals seem to be created after Adam. Now, this brings us to the question how literal the seven days in Genesis are. There's quite a debate even among evangelical scholars. The Hebrew word for day does not necessarily refer to 24 hours. We read about the day of the Lord. It's a time period that lasts longer than one day. Uh, and even in Genesis 2 verse 4 it speaks about the day that the Lord God created the heavens and the earth. It refers to the entire week of creation. In Psalm 90 verse 4, a psalm, interestingly, ascribed to Moses, we read that a thousand years are in God's sight but a day. On the other hand, the days of Genesis 1 are described as normal days, not as periods. It says, there was evening, there was morning. Although, of course, it is unclear what this would have meant for the first three days before the sun was created. Perhaps it is helpful to point out that this debate about the days of Genesis, literal or not, did not start with the rise of science, but already appears in the writings of the Church Fathers in the early centuries of the Church. <laughs> it's interesting though that their angle was different from ours, that their problem was a different one. We read Genesis 1 and ask, why so short, only one week? Doesn't science claim, doesn't science prove that it took much longer? The Church Fathers read Genesis 1 and asked, why so long? Could not God do it in a moment? Was it such a heavy task that even God needed a week to accomplish it? Of course not. But it serves to establish the week as a pattern for humans, including the Sabbath as a day of rest. It introduces rhythm into creation. And it shows if we work six days and then rest one day, we follow the example that God set. We may therefore be looking at the week as a literary framework, not a literal week of seven ordinary days. It is the framework the author uses to speak about creation. Or it could be a kind of anthropomorphism. This is God's working week expressed in human time. Since God is not limited by human time, 
this does not tell us anything about the quantity of our chronological time that was involved. This was heavenly, not earthly time. In that case, the seven days in Genesis would not be literal and would not tell us anything about the duration of creation. At this point, let's look at the six days a bit more in detail. In 1 verse 2, it says two things about the earth in the beginning. It was without form and it was void or empty. This corresponds to the first three days where God creates forms or spaces by means of separations and with the second group of three days in which God creates content, that is, the inhabitants of the spaces created on the first three days. On day one, God separates light from darkness and day from night. Now, this corresponds to day four, when God creates the lights and fills the form. On day two, God separates the waters above from the waters below. This corresponds to day 5, when God makes the animals of the sea and of the sky. They filled the form or the space that God had created on the second day. On day 3, God first separates the land from the sea and then he lets the vegetation grow. Notice these plants did not appear immediately, as in God spoke, and instantly it was there. There is a process in 1 verse 13. The earth, the earth, brought forth vegetation. This corresponds to day 6, when God first creates the animals of the earth, and then, as the crown and climax, the human. In all of this, the emphasis is on function and purpose. This is very different from the way we look at the world. The same scientific mindset works with cause and effect. It explains how things come to be the way they are and how they work. But it cannot answer the question of purpose. Why? What for? We may perhaps explain what the function of a particular organ is, but the function of the entire organism, the animal, or of human beings, what they are for, what their purpose is, well, that's beyond science. To ask for purpose or meaning, to ask why things exist, is not a scientific question. The Hebrew mindset understood the origin of things as personal and in terms of purpose or function. The question is not how, but for what, and by whom. This is the sort of question that Genesis 1 seeks to answer. Again, what we find is that this text does not play by our rules or fit our concepts, our way of thinking about the world. It does not set out to tell us about science and evolution. <laughs> this would, of course, never have occurred to Moses or any Israelite reading this in the 2nd or 1st millennium BC. The world they lived in was very different from our world. <laughs> 